Joker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, 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 my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. And today's guest on the show is longtime poker pro, Darren Elias. Darren's just 34 years old, but he's already established himself as the end boss of the World Poker Tour. It's exceptionally difficult to win a prestigious award like WPT Player of the Year at any point in anyone's life, but Darren is a man who eats extremely difficult things for breakfast. He not only holds the record for most WPT wins with four, but also holds the record for most final tables with 12 and cashes with 38. He is a true model of high-level poker consistency. And like most high-level players over the course of the pandemic, he's taken advantage of his year being locked inside by immersing himself in online poker. In his own words, the buy-ins are so much bigger, the level of play is so much higher, you really have to bring your best. To the surprise of absolutely no one, Darren has risen to the occasion like he always does and has been feasting on the souls of his virtual competitors. He's also recently teamed up with past CPG guest, the founder of Faded Spade, Tom Wheaton, at Above the Felt Entertainment, and you're about to learn how that experience has been going. In today's episode, packed full of greatness bombs with Darren Elias, you're going to learn why Billy Baxter needs to come on a CPG and tell us more poker stories, how Darren has tackled his transition to being a regular in the online streets, the one thing that makes even the great Darren Elias anxious, and much, much more. And now, without any further ado, I bring to you four-time WPT champ, the one and only Darren Elias. Mr. Elias, welcome back to the show, sir. How you doing? Good, good. Thanks, Brad. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. If I remember correctly, in the last time we spoke, you told the listener that they could find you at the Brigada. And I got to say, some things have happened since then. So tell me, what's been going on in your world over the last year? Over the last year, I've, I've been playing a lot of uh, online poker, I'd say. I've kind of shifted when uh, when COVID hit and there were no live tournaments, I kind of had this choice. Am I going to stay at home and not play that much poker, become complacent, or uh, kind of make something happen and uh, compete online in these in these bigger games and get back to playing online tournaments, which is which is what I've been doing the last year or so. And how how's that been playing in the online world? Pretty good. The, the game's definitely changed a bit since since when I came up online, which was. 2008 through 2011 which is seems so long ago that the buy-ins are so much bigger the level of play is so much higher you really have to to bring your best every day to compete or or you're going to get crushed because these guys are good on the uh the the global networks the ggs the party poker and uh the buy-ins have just at, at the high stakes have just changed so much where when i was coming up a big sunday you might play five thousand ten thousand in buy-ins and now some of these Sundays I'm fine. I'm in for 150, 200,000 playing the regular schedule on GG or party. It's, it's gotten so big. Yeah. Uh, had ape styles on before the pandemic. And he was talking to me about like the regular 25 K's on GG and like racking up like a million in wins, uh, having sold action and then <laughs> taking all of himself and going on a downer and like being mm-hmm. stuck for the experience over this. It was like a month and a half of like winning yeah. a million, losing a million. Pretty crazy. 
Yeah, I was looking at the stats, whatever. I, I think I, I, my earnings, which isn't profit, of course, probably won more uh, in the last six months than I have in my whole online career, just because of the buy-in and the nature of these tournaments with re-entry too. And some of these 25 kids have five, six hours of re-entry. You can re-enter with 10 blinds. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild. How would you say immersing yourself back in the online world, like has it affected your poker game positively? Are, do you find yourself sharper than previously? Absolutely. I'd say I'm probably the best player I've been in my career right now, just because you have to be, you just have to be familiar with the theory if you're going to compete against these players. And by no means am I, am I out studying these guys or doing as much solver work as some of these like top, top players, but I know enough about it to compete. And uh, it's definitely kept me sharper. And uh, anytime I play in a, to say on the American network or live, you can just, it's just a completely different game compared to the, the high stakes online global network. Yeah, absolutely. And that was, uh, I've spoken about it before, but that was one thing that like when I played four years cash at higher stakes, living at commerce, yeah, my, my game deteriorated. When I went back to online, I was like, uh, uh Oh, <laughs> I have yes. to like improve my fundamentals. Like, uh, things have been kind of slipping. Um, it was really a little bizarre. Yeah. But I'm sure you made a lot of money at commerce. Sometimes you have to weigh this decision. Like, do I want to get better or do I want to play against bad players and make a lot of money? And, um, hopefully you can do both, but it, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you have to grind out a smaller win rate to improve and, and play against these better players. Yeah. For what it's worth, I think it probably took three or four months to reacclimate myself back to that world. But like live is just, it, it's just a different thing. Um, it, it's almost like, stepping into a time machine sometimes with some of the things that happen. Um, it's just wild. Something else has happened. You, you've joined up with Tom Wheaton. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I joined uh, above the felt, um, uh, known Tom for a couple of years through faded spade where he, he owns the the card company for world poker tour that we use for a lot of the events and, uh, kind of pitched me on the, on this company, this above the felt representation deal where, he's kind of willing to do a lot of work and um, marketing to, to get players gigs almost, or um, parents fees and ambassadorships maybe at some point. And, and it's really something that I'm not willing to do, or I've never put a lot of work into. And, and I don't feel super comfortable like selling myself or, or marketing myself. It's not, not something I've ever done, but I, I'm open to, I'm open to those kind of deals. And if someone is willing to, to do it for me. I, I think that's, that's great because looking back on my career, I, I've made very little money besides winning in poker, like from, from sponsorships or deals, probably my whole career, probably less than $10,000 I've made in like sponsorship type money or appearance fees kind of thing, which seems, seems like it could be more. It, it it does for a four, four time WPT champ um, making less than 10 K in sponsorship deals for your entire career that that seems quite quite low and that that's one thing that like i i don't know maybe it's a remnant of black friday right like i I think like if things would have continued on the trajectory that they were on then there probably would have been a ton more opportunities like you know i I had madsen on the podcast he he was making like seven or eight k a month on full tilt and had like no responsibilities really other than like play a tournament in a Jersey sometimes. But yeah, I I think too, like poker is just, especially in like the Texas world is just booming. And it feels like there's this competition there, but amongst all the card rooms popping up that will create opportunities for folks like yourself to, you know, go play some bigger stakes poker, hang out and, you know, get paid to do so. Yeah. Yeah, this event in Houston should be good. Anytime there's these new emerging markets of uh, poker where they haven't really had it before, they haven't had tournaments, there's always a huge demand and uh, excitement for poker that it's fun to see. And these people, they want to meet players they see on TV. They want to talk about it. And uh, I'm, I'm willing to do that. And um, I, I think that's that's great. Uh, hopefully, like, all sides benefit from that. It's, it's, a, it's a good relationship between the players, the room. And when I first went to play poker in Brazil, it was kind of like a a similar thing where just so much excitement for the game. And uh, it's good to see because sometimes we can get a little like 
jaded and seeing the same faces in Vegas with commerce, especially is kind of, it's not a exciting uh, poker scene. Yeah. Or, or like, you know, I remember the first time I saw Doyle, like in Tunica, I'm just like hanging out in the, the tournament room and Doyle like whizzes by on his, uh, little scooter thing and i was like holy shit that's doyle yeah. like you know you, you get that feeling when you see these guys for the first time and then you know over time it's just like whatever like <laughs> this is yeah. just a poker tournament and they're here because they're poker professionals and i'm a professional so let's just move on but yeah, yeah. when when you're first coming up like i'll still remember the first time i played uh ivy was at my table it's like oh my gosh i'm like 22 years old i'm playing against for ivy like that's super exciting makes the day fun and hopefully we can give some of these players that experience where they get to play against Chris Moneymaker or myself, someone like that. And, and they, uh, they enjoy it. Oh, I'm sure they will. I'm sure it'll be memories that last for a very long time. So let's go back in time a little bit to really the beginning of your career. And I want to ask you, um, who's your biggest influence in getting involved in the world of poker? In the beginning of my career, I guess I would say my, my family and, and my grandmother, where we played a lot of we played a lot of cards growing up. We played spades, hearts, um, scat. We played all these these little games. There's just constantly card playing in my house, which which I enjoyed and kind of played a lot of games on the internet and that kind of morphed into poker when I was like fifteen or sixteen. Start started playing online on uh, like Ultimate Bet and the old the old school party poker. And uh, I would I would give a lot of credit to my grandma for, for playing cards with me and, and making it an enjoyable experience, but still competitive where like we played for money. We played like very kind of intense games for quarters. And uh, I would say her, she was definitely my biggest influence. When it comes to like other players, I was very like kind of a lone wolf where I didn't really talk hands with many people. I did my own thing. I I, I didn't study with people growing up. So I was... I was playing online, but I was very much um, on my own when I started playing. Why? Why the lone wolf mentality? You just weren't. Were you not interested in studying with other people? Did you just didn't want to be distracted? I don't know. Probably a little bit of my personality, where I, I enjoy being independent and and like coming to these conclusions myself. And uh, I didn't really, I didn't have people around me in, in real life that that played a lot of online poker. Like a, a couple guys in my college played, but we weren't like talking hands every day. And then I wasn't too close with, I didn't want to be in some like internet group talking hands. Like that, that's not really me. So it was kind of, kind of a result of my personality. I'd say. Yeah. I got very fortunate. I also, I've tried like even 15 years ago to do like the two plus two thing. And I just couldn't do it. I'm like, I can't, mm -hmm. I just can't like a, it's like one per like you, you post a hand, Somebody will agree, 10 people will echo it, and I'm like, yeah, I don't agree, but I'm not even, it's not worth it for me to even jump in there and say something to face all the backlash or whatever it is. It's just yeah. too much effort and work. Um, and it, yeah. it can be detrimental. Like, like I think it's great to to get feedback from from players better than you about hands. I, I, think that, I think that's good. That's a good way to learn. That's a good way to get better. But at some point, if you're asking too many people and you're getting too many different things in your head it, it's it's noise and, and it can it can be detrimental to your game where I, i've done a little bit of coaching and i one of my students would every time she would play a hand she would send it send it to 20 people and get all this different feedback say da, 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 and it's just like melts your brain a little bit where you're better off having one idea and being confident in it and if it's wrong you would sort it out but you're, you're better off having that than having uh, all these different ideas in your head at the same time yeah, it's interesting in that like poker is obviously a very complex game and but a lot of times with my private coaching students like they just overthink things. It, it's like mm -hmm. it's just pure overthink like I've got the range advantage here like just like a million different thoughts and it's like why why so much like you you should just be betting like <laughs> you yeah. should just be betting and then sort of going from there um like mapping out different decisions on like turn different equity shifting turns and it's like we're not at the turn yet and we don't even know what they're going to do on the flop so like let's just bet and then just take the data points as they come yeah and keeping it simple is, is a great is a great thing to coach i mean i i have a lot of respect for for people who can do poker coaching and are successful and patient with it. I'm def that's definitely not one of my strengths. While I have tried to do coaching, I get frustrated pretty easily. And I have 
I, I think it's so difficult. Like I can, it's very easy for me to tell somebody, this is what you did wrong. This is what you should do, but to get them to execute it in game the next time that spot pops up is really the challenge. I think as the coach and the player and uh, very often I'll pass along an idea a concept, it will be understood, but then it gets misapplied in, in a situation that's slightly different or something. And then, <laughs> Oh, but not, not in that circumstance, you don't do that. So it's uh it's frustrating and, and, but I do understand it where some people poker comes more naturally and they understand these concepts intuitively. Other people, they have to learn and study it. And I've started learning chess, for example, I'm playing this chess tournament poker thing in a month. And these coaches are explaining these ideas to me. And I, I feel like the poker students where I'm just, I'm misapplying it and doing it wrong. I'm like, Oh, this is what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. That, Oh, that, that's what's happening behind the scenes there. Um, and, and you're right. Like, I think coaching and playing are just two different skill sets and communi- transferring of knowledge and information is just such a unique thing. And it, it, it's, you know, I think back to all the people that are like, never talk about poker strategy, never coach people, never make training, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, these people have obviously never tried to help somebody <laughs> learn how to play poker. Cause they don't realize how difficult it is. Yeah. Like, it ain't that easy. You can't just give information and then everybody applies it perfectly across the board. Yeah, and, and now you have these top players. I mean, Nick Petrangelo, my friend, he probably has like hundreds of hours of content out there and solver work and all this high-level stuff. But if you put a random person in front of that course and make them watch 100 hours of it, they're not magically a, an elite poker player. Like They're going to have an incredibly hard time applying that in-game in the right situation. So it, it's uh, it's very difficult. Yeah, it really is. Um, going back to your grandma, though, that 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 is funny to me because it, it's a commonality I've – heard from lots of my guests and actually it's it's my story as well like i was heavily into online spades for probably four years before i started playing poker and i've just noticed that like lots of people were in magic the gathering played cards growing up they had some sort of connection with cards before they became a high level poker player do you think there's anything to that yeah definitely like an affinity for games like competition and games because yeah, Magic the Gathering is a good example. I know a lot of players that came from that world. Um, Bryn, even Bryn Kenny played Magic, uh, David Williams, those kind of guys. And also, like, the online gaming world, you get people that came from, like, StarCraft, like Elki, and ga- games like that. Doug Polk played a lot of Warcraft 3, like, these kind of, like, competitive online gaming um, people that, that liked those kind of games, I think, did well with with online poker. And... Uh, it wasn't always cards, but, but it's a lot of people too came for me, which is more of a traditional, like just playing cards with your family background. And eventually I got into the online, I would play hearts online, spades online and uh, eventually poker, but definitely something that a lot of uh, poker pros started with. Yeah. It's, it, it's interesting. It, it, it almost makes me think that like, if you were trying to build like the perfect poker terminators, then it, they almost need to be like introduced to cards at like seven or eight years old, you know, like the, the Russians and the chess uh, prodigies. Yep. Trained from a young age. Yeah. My uh, having kids now, my daughter, like, Oh, she, she likes to play cards. We play a little poker, but uh, you can tell she's definitely super competitive and, and almost like won't even play because she's afraid of losing. She just only wants to win. So yeah, we'll see how that turns out. <laughs> well, chip off the old block, right? So tell me a story about your most favorite session ever or one of your most favorite sessions ever. Could be cash, could be tournament. I think some of my most enjoyable poker experiences came in the summer. I want to say it was like three or four years ago playing Deuce to Seven No Limit uh, cash with Billy Baxter and, and a lot of the live pros where we would play 200, 400 deuce every day, like 10, 11 AM in uh, either Bobby's room or Aria. And it was just kind of felt like a casual home game. And I was, I, I enjoy playing with Billy because you get to hear a lot of the the old time stories. I mean, this is a guy who like backed Stu Unger and <laughs> he, he's, yeah. he walks into the room. He's talking with Doyle, Lyle Berman, all these like, relics of the poker game and and to be able to to sit there firsthand and experience that is is pretty cool to get some history um from those kind of guys and also deuce to seven no limit one of my favorite games to be able to play that high stakes every day in a soft lineup it is fun too so that that summer was probably one of my favorite uh poker 
Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to lie. Like there is this um you get conditioned to seeing people but hearing the stories, I think that is like my favorite thing about because like that's what pulled me into poker was like reading stories of, you know, Doyle and Sailor Roberts and Amarillo Slim and those kind of guys. Um do you have any memorable Billy Baxter stories that come to mind just <laughs> while we're while we're here? Um he was he told me one where he was he was in a in a big deuce of seven game and he, he they played very big back then i guess in the 80s they played like 1k 2k or something against criminals like like gangsters kind of type of games and uh he told a story where he he went to the bathroom and he let this guy play his hand and uh the guy gets dealt like a pat seven or pat eight and uh by the time <laughs> he's got two hundred three hundred thousand dollars in front of him and by the time billy's out the guy's like yelling at him like I'm, I'm all in like he's coming back and <laughs> ends, ends up doubling up winning like half a million dollar pot just while billy's taking a piss or something <laughs> at eight and the guy's drawn dead jesus christ it is uh no limit to seven is it single draw yeah single draw you get five cards one draw two three four five sevens uh best hand no straights no flushes and uh beautiful game it just doesn't doesn't get spread very much pretty rarely played game yeah it, it sounds I mean, 1K, 2K in the 80s. Jesus. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. that's crazy. So going from your most favorite session, do you have any least favorite sessions that stick out in your mind? Mm, least favorite sessions. I, th- this TV cash game that I played for WPT was, was pretty frustrating. I, I played uh, recently because I haven't been able to play a lot of cash games, if we're speaking honestly, the last four or five years because of the private private games i mean I, i'm almost impossible for me to find a game bigger than 10 20 no limit where where i can play and uh i get this invite to wpt cash game great lineup we're playing straddles 200 400 800 i think it actually airs on tv this week or something and at any time like you get a good you get a big shot like that in a good lineup i i, I always try to keep all myself or a big piece of myself and the the more rare the opportunities are, I think the more aggressive you need to be with your shot taking and keeping percentage of yourself. So in a, in a game like that, even though it's huge, I'm keeping nearly all of myself. And to get uh, lose everything you got in front of you in a game like that in a great lineup is uh, frustrating. <laughs> so I'm guessing it doesn't end well. Um, spoiler <laughs> I don't give alert! Any spoilers because it's on TV, <laughs> but I run it up and then uh, run it back down. You know? Yeah, I think I saw where you ran it up against Perkins, right? Three butt pot, mm-hmm. eight nine jack, um, nothing like a little double up there. Yeah, yeah. When he says fifty thousand, and you're sitting there with the nuts on the flop, it's uh, nice. But uh, he ends up getting it all back. So it, it'll make for good TV. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, by the time this comes out, that uh, the episodes will probably have been released. So no no opportunity of spoiling but yeah I, I guess that does put a damper on that one little clip where, where did y'all turn the cards up i mean did you see that he had like the jack 10 and you're like oh well yeah yeah we uh we flipped the cards over on the all-ins just because it's a tv game i think and uh yeah i, I knew he's he has to go runner runner boat to, to to uh to win there run yeah. the chop chop equity not not a bad spot not a bad spot yeah, yeah we'll take it when you think of pots one in your career, what's the first hand that comes to mind? First hand pots one. Yeah. I don't know if I told this story on on this podcast and maybe it was another one, but I remember the first time I was in a casino playing like three, six or four, eight limit. I'll, I'll always remember this hand where I like I'm in the big blind right away. Seven, eight suited in a limit game. Everybody limps. I raised <laughs> and, uh, which is outrageous uh, yeah I, I didn't really know what i was doing um like a whole table calls flop four five six and uh i think it's a check and i think it's smart to try to check raise here uh check bet call 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 and uh i try to check raise and i, I string bet and uh <laughs> I'll, I'll always remember that situation just the total noob idiot <laughs> raising with seven eight suited out of the big blind flopping the nuts string betting I end up still winning the pot eventually, but just completely butchered it. And uh, that I always remember that hand from Casino Morongo, two four three six limit, whatever it was. It's always those early hands that stick in our brains so much. I mean, you, you played pots for hundreds of thousands of dollars. The hand that we just talked about with Perkins is like a 
couple hundred thousand dollar pot. Um, but the mm-hmm. one that one that comes to mind is this, you know, two, three, six or four, eight limit hand from a million years ago where you just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hilariously made a few mistakes. Yeah. And I think it's good to remember that stuff and not become um, too like callous to, to all of it, because now with pros, the swings are so big and nothing really phases you when you've been in the game and, and playing for these huge amounts of money. But you can still look back and reflect. Like, I remember the first time I played two five, like I, I was playing limit and then I moved to, to playing two five live. And I was like, shocked like oh look at all this money on the table the red chips people were betting 20 40 dollars and i was like shook by the amount of money being a young kid with like 100 200 bucks on the table and uh i'll I'll still remember that it's tough to get that feeling of being the the new player at high stakes as as you've been in the game longer but it's still nice to have those memories and reflect on yeah i've told my story, like if I were to ask this question to myself, I, I've told it before on the podcast, but it's just, I love, I love it because for one, I remember the feeling of getting on the boat to nowhere and waiting to get to international waters so that I could play poker, right? Like, and I was 20 years old, so not old enough to even enter a casino yet. And it, it was just so exciting. Like it, it was just this exciting new adventure and one of the very first hands that I played, I was on the boat and I had aces and I'm pretty sure it was either four, eight or five. I think it was four, eight because there were just an ungodly amount of white chips and I get aces and like, I'm just raising and re-raising. I don't even remember the board. I don't remember the action. Just like, <laughs> I don't think the border action even mattered. I'm just like raising at every opportunity to yeah. raise. There's a one liner out there. You're just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I scooped the pot. So like the, the dealers like pushing the, the chips to me. And, and I realized like in that moment that like I'm on a boat and I'm like kind of looking out the window of the boat mm-hmm. and, and I realized like, I don't, I don't feel so good. Um, some, something's not right. And like, I just like run out from the second floor and just spew, like I just spew onto the lower deck just everywhere. And that's like one of the, one of the very first hands of poker that I played. I, I don't think I'll ever forget that memory. That's that's great. The only thing better would be if you like took a bad beat and then it made you throw up. But still, <laughs> winning the pot and then yakking off the boat's pretty good. Yeah, it, it was nice. That that was when I realized that drama mean is a thing that's going to be a part of my life for a long time. Yeah, um, I was I played a little bit on those boats in South Carolina when when I was lifeguarding on the beach there in my I guess late teens, early twenties. I always thought it was awkward because, like you said, you have to wait to get international waters, and then you have kind of this weird ride home too where there's like 45 minutes to an hour where you can't gamble usually drink service is cut off and you're just like sitting next to the guy you stack like <laughs> waiting to get home yeah. some awkward ride ride homes on the boat it's like all the machines are off it's just like dead <laughs> silent and then all of a sudden they're just on and you just got like a little casino and then they just shut them all down again it's sad it's like when you're at the bar and the lights come on you're like oh it goes over <laughs> yep time to take the ride home yeah. um when you think of pots that you've lost what's the first memory that comes to mind mm, some of the the pots i've played in uh the super high roller bowl where, where I've, I've played two of those where whenever it's higher stakes those pots stick with me a little longer so, so i think of a couple hands i've played in bahamas super high roller bowl in london where for me, anytime those you put, you get to play against really the best of the best, the, the top players, and you get put in these challenging situations where they're really capable of of these plays, and they're they're playing a lot like the solvers, where most people are misapplying it or aren't really capable of it. And and when you play against the the true top players, you get put in these really really challenging spots because they actually are capable of making this computer-like bluff for all the money deep in the tournament with a ridiculous like combo so uh and they've you get to the river and and you're playing against this mixed strategy that the guy actually like rolled a 20 on the flop and an 80 on the like you have to deal with all these like factors and the, the, the time pressure too you're on a shot clock so some some of those hands from from there mostly that i've lost uh will, will stick with me for sure i 
have a co-host for Tactical Tuesday, and he's he's journeying out. He's one of my students who's had a lot of success in the online streets, and now he took a trip to Vegas because he's freshly vaccinated. Um, mm-hmm. And he he went from like a basically like a five ten nitty type player to like a winning one k nl reg uh aggressive like 10 bb plus per 100 winner and now he's going back to like 510 and he's like you know what can i expect like I, i'm a little nervous because i i only played like three months of 510 before the pandemic and i'm like dude like <laughs> just don't just go play and like don't worry about anything you'll understand that like this is not what you're building it up to be and, and now He's playing the 1020 at the Bellagio. Like he, this is like four days after being there. He's like, okay, I, I, I get it now. Like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not afraid anymore. Um, yeah, with the live like, games, once you get to 510, and if you're nervous, like sit there a couple hours, see a few showdowns, and you'll your nerves should be gone when you see the level of play at most of those games. Yeah, he he was like he watched the 510 at Hawaiian Gardens, and I was like, did you play? He's like, no. He's like, I saw somebody limp from under the gun somebody open and then two people call behind and I just walked away. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that, that's the expectation. Um, but, but he, he mentioned to me that like at 10 20, the game got tougher at Bellagio and the stacks got a little deeper. And, and he told me like, I, I'm, I'm having fun now because like he wants to play good players. He wants to be surrounded by good players. Not that he seeks out impossible games, but he just likes the competition level. Do you find the same thing um, for yourself, like in these super high roller bowls? Absolutely. If it's, if we're talking about enjoyment and like challenging myself and, and the type of poker I like, uh, playing against those guys is, is the, the top. And, and that's, that's great. I enjoy those. It's just from a financial perspective, I, I don't, I don't really like playing tournaments with small pieces of myself. I, I like playing with my own money. I don't love the international travel. So I, I don't love, like, if you, if you, offer me two things i can go to borgata and play a 3500 um all my money it's an hour drive or have all myself or i can fly to london play a 300k keep 10 percent of myself five to ten percent of myself or something um i'm gonna take the i'm gonna take the borgata every time but if we're talking about just just the poker like which would i rather play i'd, I'd rather play the uh the super high rollers and, and test myself against those guys yeah, it, I think I think really you need kind of a mix, right? Like just you you need one to for cash flow purposes and to be a successful poker player. You need the other for the challenge element of testing yourself, seeing what you're made of, um, just kind of getting in a, in a flow state um, requires a, a challenge, right? It's hard to get in flow when like, you know, it, it's just easy mode. And it, it tells you a lot about yourself and your game when you play against either those guys or when you, you play against uh, an AI or like the, the solver, like you get in this spot and you're like, wow, I don't, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with this spot. Maybe this is a weakness. Maybe I need to, to look at what I should be doing here. And when you play against weaker players, that doesn't come up too much. But when, when you play against computers or top guys, you kind of get exposed in these spots where I'm not so sure what's right here. I'm not comfortable here where, um, they really put you to the test. Yeah, it's that. That's the thing. Is like the best players will punish you for doing something that bad players won't. Right? Like like opening the action on the river with a capped range um, as with like a small value bet, and then all of a sudden it's like you know you get check raised all in for like two x pot, and you're just like, why the fuck did I do that? And, and then then it's this like. Do they like, are they just trying to exploit me because they know that I'm capped? Are they expanding their value range? Like what is going on here? Um, Whereas like you can just do that at small stakes and like they just never find the action of check raising all in with enough bluffs. And and, like, that's sort of just the difference is like the, the great players will put you in spots where you are just like shaking your head. Like I feel a little lost. I don't know. Like I I know that you have some bluff combos, but I don't know exactly what they are and they're just not intuitive. And really that that's just the, the major difference in playing against really good players and not so good players is like the really good players will punish you if you make any sort of misstep. Yep. And that's the, that's a good example. Like a spot like that. And the shortcut, I would say a lot of weaker players would do is just, Oh, I'm not going to make this thin value bet against this top player because he's going to put me in the cage with this bluff. Where, in, a, in 
actuality, the, the right thing to do is make the bet. You get raised all in sometimes, and then you have to try to figure out that decision. And that is, that is the top level. That's how the hand probably should be played. And uh, you can't shy away from that decision, but it's not a comfortable, not a comfortable one. And one that is, uh, is going to be tough to make. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's like, my, my students will come to me and, and they're like, could I have folded this at an earlier street? <laughs> it's like just a completely normal. Like, it's like they're trying to get away from the pain before they this situation. Yeah. yeah. It's like, no, you, sometimes you just are in it and you have to deal with it when it comes. And like, that's poker, you know, you, you don't just sit down and play poker and flop top set and have aces pre-flop every hand. And like, it's full of marginal spots and you just have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yep. And the better players you play against, the more frequently these tough spots are going to come up, the less easy hands you're going to have. And that's just natural. Yep. That's just how, how the game operates. You've survived pre-flop boot camp. You've shot the fish in a barrel. Now, prepare yourself for the feeding frenzy. Comprehensive strategy for gutting every fish in your player pool. Data driven hero bluffs, light call downs, and perfect value bets that are maximally designed to hurt some feelings. Feeding Frenzy. Available now at chasingpokergreatness.com slash feeding frenzy. Could you tell me a, a lesson that you've learned from? I call it a dark teacher, but basically a bad experience, something that, you know, just has happened in the poker world that you've had a wise takeaway. I would say I'm, I've probably learned not to play private games from, from friends being cheated or not paid enough times where I'm very reluctant to ever play like a home game or anything like that, just because of all the things that could go wrong. And uh, I think some people have different risk tolerances where they're okay with that. They'll, they'll say, Oh, this is a soft lineup. I'm going to win Um, small chance. I don't get paid. I'll play anyway. Where for me, I, I've, I've had some pretty bad home game experiences. I've, I've had chips stolen out of pots from the, by the dealers and payment troubles and things like that. I've seen friends win huge numbers and not get paid that friends get cheated. So that would be kind of my lesson, I guess, to, to be careful anytime you're, playing poker for high stakes, not in a casino. And just because it might seem, might seem normal, seem okay. If you're not a scumbag and you're not a cheater, like you you might not think like, like somebody who would be cheating you, you might not be thinking of ways they could cheat you. And I just to be very careful in in those arenas. Yeah. Like I'm sort of nerf ball soft as it relates to like spotting marked cards or like some dealer mechanics i have no fucking idea what to look out for because like it's never been a thing that i've had to look out for and i'll say that like i've had some really bad home game and private game experiences myself and like it's always been curious to me why like in los angeles for instance there's like a big home game scene and they also have regular card rooms and legal card rooms where like you have these built in protections. It's been, it's always seemed odd to me that people even go to those games in the first place. Cause like the rake is off the charts. There's so much room to just get outright, you know, stolen from cheated, not paid. And then you, what recourse do you have? You know, I call the police and tell yeah. them you're lost money in an illegal poker game. No recourse. And, some people enjoy it, I guess, because it is a different vibe. The home game, like it is more relaxed. It's more of a, a lot of the games are almost like a party feel where there's a lot, a lot of other stuff going on in there. But uh, for me, I'd rather just play a tougher lineup in a casino and know the game is square and I'm going to get paid and not cheated. And I'm willing to do that every time. I, I thought too, like, it seems like there's an opportunity for card rooms to just like make some more fun atmosphere type games, right? Like is, is that even possible for them to like manufacture like a home game type environment in their card room? Yeah. I mean, I guess the closest thing you get is, is like the high stakes private rooms where you have, they have like free food and drinks. Um, I've, I've had that experience a couple times in casinos where they have like kind of a, a, a private high stakes cash room and you get special privileges in there. But uh, certainly not as wild as some of the stuff I've seen in home games. 
Well, of course, that's <laughs> that's a given. <laughs> Shout out to Paul Pierce. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I I did, and yeah, we'll we'll just say that like there's a lot of things like that that go on at at home games that I, I guess maybe attract. Yeah, they they attract certainly people with a lot of disposable income um, to play cards in that environment versus like the you know the commerce casino environment. Yeah, what would you consider a weakness? as related to your poker game and then what regular steps do you take to overcome said weakness one of my weaknesses i would say is i get very tilted if i'm not playing my best where like i i think people have a range of a lot of people have a range of where they play like best out of when they're playing their best they're at 100 and sometimes they'll play at 80 sometimes they'll play at 70 and if i'm playing at 100 i'm playing my best and then one day i i, I play poorly i i say I play it like a 90 or I make a big mistake that that really rattles me and I I stop playing kind of one of my weaknesses a lot of people will continue grinding oh I'm playing a little worse but I'm still winning I should still be in there playing where if I if I find I'm not playing well I I stop so I, I don't, that kind of affects my schedule where I don't play as much as most people and if I'm playing poorly sometimes I will take a break in, instead of Maybe I should just keep at it, keep studying, try to try to figure out what happened. But I do take breaks, and I'm more of a low volume player, kind of because of this head case I have, where I'm playing not my best. Really tilts me, and rattles me. Have you taken any steps to try to move past that, or is just a not thing? Really. You I mean, accept? I've never done like mental coaching or anything like that. Maybe maybe that would be helpful, but I kind of uh, deal with it myself and. At this point in my life, I'm okay with it because I have family and kids where I kind of, I'll play a week or two at, at a series. I'll play four or five tournaments and then come home and, and not really think about poker, play poker um, for a couple weeks. And then the kind of like binge and purge um, system works well for me. And it, it it is detrimental when I have to play longer Cedric series. So I, I struggle a little bit of the World Series where it's too, I can't play every day for two months. And especially where I have this this thing where if I'm playing badly, I don't want to be there and I'm tilted. So the the shorter series that that format works better for me. The World Poker Tour or uh, where there's one big event, maybe maybe there's a, a main event, a high roller, another event, two or three events a week or so. Th- that's good for me where I have a couple events. I'm fully committed. I'm excited to play. I get there. I play. I go home. Where if it's a big drawn out. 10, 20 event series, I, I usually don't fare as well um, because of that weakness. And what, what would you say is an indicator that maybe you're not playing your best uh, or that you're about to get upset with yourself? Usually if I ever have to ask myself, like, do I want to play today? That's something I use in my head. Like, if I have to ask myself if I want to play, I probably shouldn't play. Is Like, because when I'm hungry and, like, really into it, like, I, I don't ask myself, of course I'm going to play the tournament. Like, I'm jacked up about it. I want to win. So if I have to ask myself if I want to play, then like stay home, don't even bother. Because because I've I've been there when I don't want to play and I'm not doing my best. I'm like, oh, um, maybe I get a higher variance line here, putting in this three bet and finding a flip, and I might get knocked out. Like like you don't want that to ever be in your thought process where you're. you're and I see a lot of players who do play like that, where where they're playing just they don't even want to be there and they're not they're not fully committed and. uh this game's hard enough to beat when you are fully committed playing your best that I just try to avoid playing at all. If I'm thinking like that. Yeah. It, it's like you get stuck in this mindset of like, I get paid to show up. I, I get to paid to play tournaments. I get played to put in hours at cash. So you have to, even if you don't feel like it. And like, mm-hmm. I, I don't anecdotally, I would say that those sessions just never have ended well for me historically, where it's like, I've got to force myself to go to the table, to buy in. It's like trying to find anything else in the world to distract me so that I can like (laughs) take a break and walk around. Um, Just not, not a good time. Um, And with, with tournaments, it's, it's, you see this event on the schedule, like, Oh, this is a, I have X ROI and that expectation just by showing up and playing this event. But if you don't want to be there, your your expectation probably isn't that number you're thinking it is. And uh, a lot of people would be better off staying home. Absolutely. Another thing that that happens for me when I'm playing is like sometimes like if I'm confident and just in flow, 
then I'll just react, right? It's like I just will make a big fold because I think villain's under bluffing and the fold just feels right. But then like if I'm less confident and you know maybe I'm not on my A game that day, I'll hit that decision point and then it'll be like this internal battle of like, hmm, I think I should fold, but folding's exploitable. I don't know. Uh, okay, I guess I'll just play it safe and call, and then like you get shown the nuts. And, and I, like those days, I realized like I'm not firing on all cylinders because if I were, then I would just trust my intuition and just confidently make a decision one way or the other. Yeah, that and that's huge. Like having conviction in your intuition and really believing it and executing it is huge. Where I mean. Um, you've played a lot, a lot of live poker. I'm sure you've seen the, oh, I know you have it, but I call. Like, the, the players that play like that are, are really, they know, but they don't have the the faith in themselves that they understand the situation well enough to actually execute on it. Yeah, I mean, it was something that Negranu did for, like, years, right? Like, he says what your hand is and then still puts the money in. There was a hand that was played maybe a year and a half or so ago. It was a Kristen Bicknell versus Daro Kearney hand where she folded a boat on the river. And that hand just always kind of sticks with me as like, just from a professional standpoint, I, I don't think that like, I think there are very few people that can really appreciate like what she did and not just appreciate it from like a technical s standpoint of making a big fold, but just having the conviction and confidence in yourself to do that. When you know that like, there's going to be a replay, people will see this. And she just says, fuck it, I don't care. Dara never has a bluff here, so I'm going to fold a full house. And, and that, to me, is just so impressive, that level of just self-confidence and self-belief. Yeah, and it, it's always tougher to make the folds because you don't get the immediate feedback where, like, you make a hero call, it's, oh, you get to see the hand. You won, you did the right thing. With a fold, you're kind of left laying in bed at night wondering if you got bluffed. So I kind of... When, when that situation you're talking about, I always think about um, folding kings preflop, which, which I've done a handful of times in, in tournaments. And uh, that's one of those high conviction. You really have to be sure spots because if you're folding kings incorrectly, that's just a huge mistake And when the guy has queens or ace-king or something. So you, spots like that, you really need to to be on your game and fully fully committed. I would say I've probably folded Kings a handful of times myself pre and funnily enough, I, I've been shown aces. <laughs> I think every single time, like they just show after I fold. Be. Yeah. I'm like, cool. Validated. Um, just that, that immediate validation. Like I, it, I would be way more tortured if they just kind of threw it into the muck, but for some reason they just f have felt inclined to show me their hand. Yeah, I, I've done it a couple times, and I'm still wondering. They, they weren't nice <laughs> enough to show me. Well, let's just say you probably did make a good fold. Well, just easier to sleep at night if we assume that you did. Yeah, I feel good about it. I feel good about those folds. What's a common assumption folks make about their poker careers you think they should spend some more time thinking about? I think some people think they i mean i get this vibe that people think they deserve to win a lot of times where uh just by showing up and playing they they deserve to win and uh not being not being real with themselves and uh objective about their play where they, they should be taking a harder look at themselves and how they're playing where a lot of people are just kind of going through the motions playing the same way year after year and kind of like i've been running bad i've been running bad i'll win eventually i expect to win where they should be taking a step back and actually looking at their play and evaluating where they are and if they've, they've fallen behind. And I think that's happened to a lot of American players who, who played online back when games were soft, when I was playing very easy to beat online MTTs 10, 15 years ago. And they're playing now and they're, they're kind of playing the same way they were 10 years ago and they haven't, haven't caught up where they kind of think they can grind their way grind their way through this, just play more and, and keep at it where they'd be better off taking a step back, looking at their game and, and studying. Yeah. And it reminds me of just a level of precision in, in another arena. And I think it was uh, the art of learning by Josh Waitzkin, where he talked about a chess master who basically started every single day meditating um, mm -hmm. for like an hour 
And basically the purpose of the meditation was to discern how he was feeling that day. Is he in a more aggressive state of Mm -hmm. being? Is he in a more passive state of being? And like that level of precision um, to go play chess. And and then when we talk about somebody just showing up expecting to get paid, who has not checked in with themselves at all, who just like thinks that because they know, just because they, they, it's not enough to know what to do. You have to actually execute and do what you're supposed to do as well. And I think that like, that's just, you, we ought to be taking those lessons from these chess masters, checking in, seeing like, how do I feel today? Who am I going to be today? Because I mean, you know, I think we all have a little bit of Jekyll and Hyde in us. Some days we're more aggressive than other days. Some days like we're, we're if a decision is like on, on the fringe of a more passive action or a more aggressive action, some days you just take all the more aggressive actions because that's just the state of mind you're in, right? Yeah. And uh, I love that book. I, I actually remember that phrase. I think it's t- tall or something was the chess master. And I, I think the big difference and the reason poker players don't do that as much or really put in as much effort is that we play against such weak players live that you can kind of get away with it where you can just show up. And a lot of times you get money thrown at you or handed to you just, just by weaker recreational players playing there where a chess grandmaster, he never gets to a tournament and he's playing a, <laughs> a, a, ch- a jump, you know, like if you actually had to play against the best players, these guys would realize like, wow, I suck. I need to get to work, but because they go to the, they go play a $500 MTT at a live casino and they're it's, it's free money. They they kind of get lulled into this false sense of security where, Oh, I, I am winning. I am okay. But it, it's all relative to who you're playing against. So poker is unique in, in that circumstance where it's all about relativity and who you're playing against. And some of these guys, I mean, you can make a living like that. You can make a living playing small stakes. Um, beating bad players you can do that but i think uh the players that do that and they play a higher stakes tournament they don't really realize what's happening it's interesting how poker just the way that it's kind of set up is like it has all these traps and all these pitfalls and, and all these places where like development can just stop and you just plateau for many years because you're not being pushed to mm-hmm. improve on a regular basis, especially if you're like a known winning player in this game that you play in five days a week. Um, why develop? Why push yourself? Right? Like that's a, it's just a very interesting game. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways to to measure success in poker. And, and I don't have the answer. Like who's the, who's the more successful poker player, the guy who has a great private game and makes $10 million a year beating idiots or the, the guy who's traveling the 100K, 300K circuit playing for 10% of himself and making way less money. Like, obviously, the, the high roller reg is the, is the way better poker player, but who's more successful? And on the opposite spectrum of the, the opposite of the low stakes guy who's not very good but wins money is the, the egotistical super high roller reg who kind of is broke but plays at a very high level and is kind of chasing that, that really high roller success, but doesn't have enough money to take a big piece of himself, has to sell all of it, has to study all day. And that's not a great existence either. So I think somewhere in the middle is probably where you want to be. Yeah. And and it's subjective too, right? It's like, what about a, you know, 200 or 500 NL online pro that plays whatever, uh, 500,000 hands a year makes over a hundred K like, is that player better or worse than like a, a guy that's fortunate enough to be in like these 50, hundred private games and, and makes a million dollars a year just by virtue of playing a much weaker competition. And he's playing at a much lower skill level. Right. So yeah. I, it's just all kind of subjective. It's really hard to measure. I think when people say, I want to be the best poker player in the world, what does that even mean? You can't even quantify it. Nobody, nobody will ever know. Yeah. And if, and if you're the eighth best poker player in the world and you're in a high roller and the other seven are at the table, like you're, you're the worst player at the table, you know? And, and that, that's how a lot of those, those tournaments work when, when you're playing in, at the highest stakes. Yeah, I mean, there might be four or five guys in the world I don't like playing against, but they're there in, in those tournaments. So it's, it's not like you get those, those, other, those other players there. There's no like middle of the line regs really when you get to the top. Yeah, I, I would imagine that there's probably going to be 
the best, the best of the best of the best. And then some, some recreationals that are just like have way too much money that are just really losing fishy type players. And there's no like medium level reg who's buying into a hundred K event. Yeah. And, and over time, I think a lot of those, t- those guys have gotten filtered out and uh, like, you don't see as many of the, the German players in the, in the high rollers anymore. And it's kind of become more, more American Canadian guys running those. And uh, it, it's interesting over the years, how the, the game has evolved and the, the study techniques have, have kind of, uh, have kind of evolved. It's interesting. Yeah, it really is. I, I'm actually very curious to see what happens in the next like 10 or 15 years in this space, because like, I think last time we talked, I was probably pessimistic about the future of online poker. And a lot of the things that I thought would come to pass kind of have with, with the RTA and people getting banned and people, people cheating. And I think you're only going to see more of that where it, it's these, these ways to get solutions quickly are going to be easier and they're going to get faster and they're going to be very tough to detect. So, I mean, I, I can tell even when I'm playing online that, that some of these guys are certainly cheating and using real-time assistance. And you you either have to deal with that or you won't play. And I think a lot of players will choose not to play down the line. Yeah, it's frustrating. It, it, it's frustrating because, like, a lot of my edge in cash games specifically come deep in the decision tree and sort of spots where a lot of players aren't very familiar. And as... I venture into those spots online. I noticed that like before we get there, villain is like using the, their full time bank going into the time bank. And, and then like they make what is a really, <laughs> what is a very, very good decision. And it always makes me suspicious. Like, man, like my, this was where really my edge has always been. I, I don't think that like, is I mean, especially early on before when we're just figuring it out that like fundamentally, uh, fundamentally sound preflop strategy this was not my edge but like add a level of complexity where it's hard to figure out and there's a lot of variables and prioritization is tough i've always shined and i've realized like over the past few years that like that's kind of going to go away as yep. these spots and deeper in the tree just get solved and then people have access to them yeah i mean if you're playing a guy who has the answers it's essentially it's an open book test and then the guys i mean it, I think that stuff is only going to happen more. And I think you see it, the, obviously the, the higher stakes you play, the more you're going to see it. Yeah, because that's where there's more money to be made. And hopefully, I mean, who knows? It's kind of beating a dead horse at this point. But I, but I think that like the only way to dissuade this kind of behavior would be to have actual real life penalties of jail or large fines, which, you know, involves regulation. And, you know, that's just a whole nother we may never even make it to that point. Yeah. And, and still very hard to detect if a guy has a computer next to him, a separate computer running the solution. What the SWAT team going to break into his house yeah. and like ca- catch him using it. Like it, it's, it's unrealistic. I think that there would ever be real people getting jail time or anything for cheating it on. And I've, I've thought about this problem more than probably most human beings in the world and like i can't come up with like an ironclad solution <laughs> like and yeah. that that's troubling to me the, but the best one i've heard is where you expose a lot of cards before the cards are dealt like uh say you flip over five cards or something um and that that would affect the strategy a lot and it's is unique every time and um too too quick for somebody to run a simulation on where they would have to adjust to the exposed cards and a a computer obviously can't do that instantly. And uh, that's probably the most elegant solution I've heard for it. But uh, even that, then you, you still, (laughs) it's harder on the players too. like all of a sudden I have to deal with all these dead cards. Um, So it it puts a lot more pressure on the player to play well too. Yeah, absolutely. Like we said, it's a tough thing. I I don't want to be the people out there trying to solve this problem. I know that there are people out there, who are trying to solve it, but it is, man, it, it it's a very tough thing to crack. All right, so let's do do some lightning round, and then you can go do whatever it is you do with your life now, Mister Elias. What's a po- what's a poker related thing that other players have raved about that hasn't worked for you, and why do you think it didn't work for you? Like the the meditation, like 
thing. I, I guess where a lot of guys get into this like holistic meditation thing where um, that that's not really me. I mean, I guess I, I take time quietly with myself sometimes thinking, reviewing hands, but not, I've never gone fully into the, the meditation route. I've, I've never committed to it. And I, I know a lot of players, especially at high stakes, rave about that, that thing and um, have had a lot of success doing it. Not sure. Maybe, maybe it would work for me if, if I tried it, but uh, something that I've never, I've never had success with. I can, I mean, I have a sp- suspicion as to maybe why, because you're kind of constructed in a natural meditative uh, you're just a natural, a person who basically like you show up, you play cards, you have no distractions. You're focused on being in the present moment the, f- the whole time. And that's like a, just a natural born skill set for you. And, and that's really like one of the major benefits of meditating regularly for folks like myself who, you know, have ADD, have some trouble focusing, get distracted easily. Um, so you're just naturally, <laughs> you're probably just naturally in a med- meditative state normally and you just thrive there i I like that answer thanks Brad. yeah my pleasure um what are some things you wish you said no to more often honestly coaching i I would say i I really i don't enjoy poker coaching and i i've i do say no a lot of times to people but i have said um said yes to some people and i have a couple students here and there that i'll work with and honestly that gives me more anxiety than playing poker ever does where I have this like lesson to do at at a certain time and I have to prepare for it. Like it feels almost like I'm back in college. I have an assignment due. (laughs) Even when I'm doing the coaching, I I really don't enjoy it. And uh, definitely something that there have been times where it it makes sense money wise to do it. I would be stupid not to take this, this offer and do the coaching, but uh, not something I enjoy at all. It's something I, in the future, I'll probably be saying no to more. Yeah. It's, poker players are naturally rebellious and <laughs> we're just nat- naturally constructed in that way, I think. And yeah, it can be challenging. Um, but I, and I think too, like you either love, love it or you don't. And if you do, then do it. And if you don't, then don't, you know, we are only on this earth for so much time. What, what are some things on the flip side that you wish you had said yes to more often? Poker related, right? Uh, Sure. <laughs> it could be, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of, I, I say yes to a lot of things where if I have an opportunity, I'll assess it. And, and if it makes sense to me, I'm, I'm very, I'm not like a, I don't get stuck in my mind, like dwelling on it. I, I will just go and say yes. So I'm not trying to think things I say yes to. I've, we go back to things I'd say no to. I'm thinking staking arrangements back in the day. Can I go back and not, not stake <laughs> players? I just, I just remember that. Um, I said, I said yes to entering a, a, creating a stable and staking a bunch of players, losing a bunch of money in the, in the beginning of my career. But um, surprisingly, buying more, buying more crypto <laughs> years ago, years ago, something like that. I think we all have that. Um, as a thing that we wish we would have said yes to more. Um, yeah, that, that's a huge one where, um, because poker players were early in, in that market. And I definitely had people explaining it to me a long time ago. You need to do this. You need to, I'm like, whatever. I can't understand that. I'm not going to do it. So uh, that, that definitely is something I should have said yes to. Yeah. And now everything is like all NFTs. And at first with the NFTs, I'm like, what is this? I don't care. This is stupid. And now I'm like kind of thinking, well, maybe you should investigate it a little, like instead of just outright dismissing it, because, you know, what if it is like another big thing, like kind of crypto, how crypto began and a lot of people just dismissed it outright. Like maybe it it does seem weird buying a digital pixelated art piece, but I don't know. So yes, the idea of a blockchain like sounded outrageous to me. I, I have this vivid memory. I was in San Francisco drinking in a bowling alley um, with my buddy who's into the crypto back then. Bitcoin was sixty cents, and he was, we were bowling, and he's trying to explain to me what the what the blockchain is. And I'm like, dude, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. Like, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> I, not, I want nothing to do with this. It sounds ridiculous. And uh, now it's sixty k. Yeah. I mean, one of my first uh, coaching students, maybe five or six years ago, offered to pay me in Bitcoin. And it was like a couple of Bitcoins for the coaching. And I'm like, nah, man, just give me money. Like, I don't want the Bitcoins. <laughs> um, whoops, that 
was a pretty good coaching opportunity in hindsight. Have you ever strongly believed something in your poker career only to reverse course later on? And if so, what led to that change of belief? I would say the the, the solvers I've I've come around on that that when they first came out, the idea um, that these people could study and mimic the computer and and get very good, I, I kind of thought that was impossible uh, to take a player who intuitively isn't that good um, to get outworked studying um, mem not. Like some of these guys that that play really aren't super naturally talented, but are are very hard workers, very good studiers, and are good at memorizing solutions. And um, that's something that I didn't really think was was possible. To, to, like I, in my head, I always thought, oh, these guys, they're just going to be trying to copy a computer. They're not going to be able to execute the strategy in game. But I think it. I'm coming around to the idea that they can at least get very good like that guys um, with less talent, but a harder work ethic and access to, to good tools to study. We're seeing more of those guys at the higher stakes now where they're, they're working their way to the top where it's, it's study and uh, solver work more than uh, intuitive talent. Yeah. Which is certainly a change from my perspective as well. Like I used to think that like, you know, I had an innate talent for playing cards and that was sort of one of the, recipes or ingredients to what had made me a successful poker player and that like i didn't think that somebody with not a lot of talent could become a, a you know high stakes or high performing poker player but these over these last you know five years or so i'm coming to grips with you know there's more than one way to skin a cat and if somebody's a hard worker they can actually work their way. A hard worker with not a lot of intuitive ability, they can work their way up. You know, they can be a success, successful poker player just by outworking other people. Um, it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Yeah, and I, I would say early in my career, I not early in my career, but maybe five years ago, I had three or five years ago, I had an arrogant attitude of like, this guy can study all he wants. I'm, I'm still going to beat him. I'm always going to beat him. And uh, now, now you, you're playing against some of these guys and they put you in a spot and you're like, oh, well, this guy a executed a good strategy here and maybe maybe I need to go study and look at that spot as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, what's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? I'm actually getting into a little bit of uh, real estate where I'm, I'm investing and in, uh, renovating some houses. I don't, I don't know if I'd say that's near and dear to my heart, but definitely something that, that's taking, uh, taking up some of my time and uh, effort where... During COVID, I kind of had this with no live tournaments. I had this all this time, and uh, what before I got recommitted to online, and even now online, I'm only playing a couple days a week. Where I just I I, I didn't want to feel complacent, where, where I can easily fall into these grooves where I can sit at home and, and do nothing, and uh, drink and watch movies and be unproductive. And uh, I didn't want to fall into that, so I was kind of looking at other outlets, things to do ways to make money and um, got into this real estate investing flipping thing. And that that's uh, that's taking up some of my time and kind of my, my only other real project besides poker and being a dad. Do you find it interesting? Like, is it a fun exercise, fun project? Medium. I would say I, I enjoy looking at the numbers, like the spreadsheets and the numbers. I, I, I enjoy less interacting with, with people. But like, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not a people person where I want to like call people on the phone and like make deals and that kind of thing. So I, I know my personality enough to know that, that I don't like that part of it, but um, the profit, the running the, the simulations on costs and things like that. I, I enjoy the, the number aspect of it. Yeah, of course you, you, you understand the, you, you, um, you gravitate towards the analytics and the data. Uh, I had a, a friend of mine who was flipping houses and was like, yeah, I find, you know, contractors by like just going to Home Depot and striking up conversations and like getting cards. And I'm like, that is not a thing that I will probably ever do in my entire life. Yeah. And the, the good news is, though, there, there are so many people like that. And uh, I mean, above the felt, Tom Whedon's a good example where there are people person, people like they enjoy interacting with people. They uh, they're willing to do hard work, make make a lot of phone calls, cold call people, and uh, those people are available to hire in in many different um, arenas. And that's not something I will ever do or am into, but I'm willing to to hire those people to do legwork. Absolutely, and, and we'll just say like I'll just say almost any arena you can hire somebody who has a skill that you don't have or that you have no interest in developing. 
Like it's something that I, I do with my business where it's like, I take on a project and I'm like, I don't know what the hell to do here. This is like trying to learn a new language. Let's just make a post on a freelancing website to see if there's somebody that can do this. And unsurprisingly, there's hundreds of people that are qualified to do this thing that so that I don't have to, you know, put in the hours learning, figuring out all the tech side. You you mentioned uh, raising your daughter too. And I, I would say that's that's probably a project that's pretty near and dear to all of our hearts as as dads. Yeah, if if the ultimate near and dear to your heart project is is children. And uh yeah, I have I have two daughters now. I have a four year old and a five month old. So uh Ooh. that's that takes up a lot of my time when I'm home. That's that's the ultimate project. Exactly. And again, that's another thing too. You were you mentioned about, you know, not feeling like playing or whatever. Well, when you have kids, it's not like you're just laying on a couch, you know, getting stoned all day and not playing cards. You've got like some fulfilling thing that you yeah. can spend your energy on. Yeah, it's very busy at home. And uh, it's a nice balance where like when I'm going to play a tournament, I'm like, okay, it'll be nice to have a little break from playing dolls. Um, going to the air- <laughs> you're going to the airport, you get a little freedom, sense of freedom. That's exciting. But then by the time the, the trip's over, the tournament's, coming to an end like i'm excited to get home i mean i'm looking at pictures of my kids on the plane i'm missing them like that that kind of thing um where you get you get you're you're happy to get away and then happy to get back at the end of the trip trip, which i like yeah I, i love that aspect of it too and uh final question man if the listener wants to find more on darren elias where can they find you on the world wide web uh twitter at darren elias on twitter old money d on uh instagram and that's probably about it i'm I'm not a huge social media poster but uh i'm on there a little bit and reach out to above the felt if you want me to come play your poker tournament do anything like that um i will be at fort lauderdale a couple weeks for the seminal hard rock open and then over to houston for that uh texas state championship yeah best of luck uh best of luck traveling to Fort Lauderdale and then to Texas, the home of No Limit Texas Hold'em, by the way. So you, you got that. <laughs> the birthplace. The birthplace. Like, I, I really want to get out there. I've never played poker in Texas. I've played poker in Oklahoma, but okay. Texas didn't really have anything going on until very recently. So that's something I'm very much looking forward to over the next year. I played Oklahoma Windstar, but never, uh, never Texas. Yep. Well, cool, man. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you for your time and your energy. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to Chasing Poker Greatness. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com to get the newsletter. Join the Greatness Village community, book a coaching session, or dive into the latest data-driven poker courses. Follow the show on Twitter at CPG Podcast.